Hello, my name is Sean Myers. I'm a student in Dr. Potkey's seminar class at Lamar University. It is spring of 2020, and I'm today I'm going to give a speech about renewable energy. Uh, first off, I'm just going to explain uh, the differences between renewable energy and non-renewable energy. Uh, renewable energy, as the name suggests, is renewable. Uh, it is everlasting. You won't run out of it. Uh, key things to talk about this is wind. There's no way to run out of wind. Uh, sunlight. You can only run out of sunlight during the night, but it comes back in the day. <coughs> so, it's a renewable source of energy. Non-renewable would be things like coal or oil or natural gas. Uh, those things which take millions of years to form are technically renewable, but the fact that it takes millions of years to come back makes it not a real expendable resource, and we'll go into the expendability of resources in a little bit. But that's, those are the key definitions. Um, now I'm just going to talk a little bit about background of renewable energy. Uh, a lot of people think that renewable energy is a newer concept and uh, hasn't been around for that long, but it actually has. Uh, the concept of renewable energy is for humans to use these renewable resources to power objects that they use in everyday life. So using the wind, like ancient Vikings did, to power their ships to go from one continent to another is an example of using renewable energy to their resource. Uh, to their advantage. So that right there is an example of how long it's been around. Uh, obviously non-renewable has been along, around just as much. Obviously uh, people hundreds of years ago have found oil and they've used it to light torches and fires, but they haven't used it uh, for internal combustion engines, obviously. Those have only been around for the last 200 years or so. Um, but so the background on these, uh, primarily the oldest one used really is either the sun or the wind. Those have been the main ones for renewable energy. Uh, sun has been used, uh, people, ancient people have been very smart and use that to actually light fires, which they've used to, uh, cook their food and whatnot. And then, uh, wind, like I said, people using uh, the wind to power their sails, to power their ships, so they can travel overseas, uh, which is honestly the greenest form of transportation that uh, they have at that time. And then uh, they also have uh, water-powered. Uh, water-powered, a key one that you could say is a uh, water wheel. Uh, which just uses the uh, rivers or currents to power a wheel to go around and that would uh, they would use the inside of a wheel to power uh, grindings uh, grinding stones grinding wheat seeds down uh, using it to spin thread anything really they've been using that for a very long time it's very old technology Newer technology for renewable energy would go into solar panels, uh, hydroelectric dams, uh, even using uh, the heat from the earth uh, to uh, power uh, water uh, uh, steam engines, to power steam engines. And those would uh, obviously not come around for, until the last mm, 50 years or so. Uh, and they've drastically improved during that time as well. Uh, I'm mainly going to talk about three types of renewable energy, the three most common, which would be solar, wind, and hydro. Hydro being water, which actually has multiple ways of being used. Uh, I'm going to explain the differences of those and go over those. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking uh, nuclear as well. Well, nuclear is its own little subcategory, actually. It isn't fully enveloped into the uh, renewable resource wheelhouse yet. Uh, the reason for that is because 
it's not a hundred percent if it's considered renewable or not because the main thing on renewable and non-renewable uh, would be uh, its waste. Uh, non-renewable materials such as coal and oil, natural gas, they all have a large amount of CO2 waste, which as we know from middle school chemistry uh, is very bad for the environment. It affects our ozone layers, it melts the ice caps, it causes global warming. And so with the waste from a nuclear reactor, uh, it would be some very bad isotopes, which are actually harmful for the environment and especially harmful for humans. Uh, it just ruins wildlife and makes uh, large areas not able to sustain life for a very long time, or if it does, it severely mutates them. So it's not considered uh, a renewable energy source at the moment. But uh, back to the renewable energy sources, uh, first thing I'm going to talk about is solar. Solar is probably the most well-known uh, renewable resource. Uh, the reason for this, in my personal opinion, is because everyone knows about solar panels. You, you can even see them on your neighbor's roofs. You really don't have to go far to get them. You could get them, honestly, down the street at some hardware stores. They sell little kits, and you can use those to power a few appliances in your home. And it really isn't terribly difficult, although it is a little expensive at the moment, to power your entire house uh, with this. The reason why I'm saying it's, it's expensive is because the solar panels themselves are still expensive. That's because the process of making them and making them efficient isn't um, the most efficient at the moment. I'm going to say most efficient. It's not the most profitable at the moment. Uh, using uh, coal, natural gas, those things to still power our homes is still the primary way of life, at least in the U.S. There are a few uh, European countries, mainly, uh, uh, mainly Scandinavian countries, that have a lot of rivers. Uh, they use dams a lot to power all their homes. But uh, I'll talk about that more when we get to the hydropower. But uh, for all the photovoltaic cells, um, back in 2012, uh, a journal said that their uh, that the energy efficiency of them was only about 20 percent, which isn't very good. Um, it's about half as efficient as coal or natural gas or those things that we commonly use. So uh, it wasn't really feasible to keep going into that at the time. But thankfully people stuck with it and now it's almost about the same efficiency. Uh, it's about 40%. Uh, now for that though, uh, the downsides of solar energy is pretty commonly it only works half the time. Uh, it only works during the daytime because the moonlight, which is just a reflection of the sunlight, is too weak to power them. Uh, as far as I know, there's no real um, moon light photovoltaic cells that can harvest that energy because it's a little too weak. And other issues with it is that it actually has to be a sunny day. It can't be cloudy. Uh, and the uh, cells actually need to be very clean. So if you live in a dusty area, you need to make sure that these uh, cells and these solar panels are have a clean surface. If they're dusty, then they can't collect as much light. So it's been very hard to do that. Now, uh, it's been... Uh, we use this at my personal high school. We installed solar panels uh, to the roof of our high school. Uh, this is a high school in the Philippines, in Manila, which is very sunny. It's on the equator, so it's sunny all year round. And it was a project to figure out what position would be the best way, uh, would be the best to position it to get the most light and get the most energy out of these solar panels. And uh, the best way to get the highest efficiency for these is to have sunlight directly on uh, the solar panels. So if your solar panels are laying at an angle, you need to have the sunlight directly 
going at like a 90 degree interval. That is the best way to do it because that is direct sunlight. You're, if you go at anything less, it's like velocity. If you go at an angle, you're not getting as much velocity. So it needs to be at a 90 degree angle. So that's also the issue though, is that the whenever you set solar panels somewhere, if you set them at this degree, you're only going to have the highest efficiency at a certain period of time. So the way to get around that is to motorize all of the solar panels so that it actually follows the sun, or it can just pivot between two positions, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And uh, again, that's time and energy and materials that are wasted to collect these to collect this energy. So my high school uh, went to all of the seniors uh, that were in high uh, physics, chemistry, and environmental, and, and environmental studies and said, figure out the best formula to uh, calculate when they would be best to be pivoted, what degrees they should be pivoted at, how often they should be pivoted. And that's what they did. And they figured that it was best to have the morning position until around uh, noon and then at noon they would switch over to the afternoon position and then it would collect the most it would be the most efficient to do that and they ran some tests as well as the calculations to make sure the results were accurate um, but again since it's the Philippines it's a very tropical country and they're prone to a lot of typhoons and such so they can't even get that much it's only about half the year that they can even get all this energy the other half is rainy season so they can't even get that Moving forward, we're going to talk about wind energy. Um, so wind energy is obviously the best in large plains or hilly areas. It would actually be primarily best at the beach because beaches are a very windy place. But because of the height and weight of these windmills, um, that these wind turbines, that it's not really feasible to get them anywhere near uh, sand. And to make it even worse, um, since they're so high and they're, they can be fairly easily tipped over, during typh during uh, hurricanes or tornadoes, they can easily fall over, and that would just be a lot of waste of time material and dangerous projectiles as well during those times. So it's actually more kept inland uh, toward wide open areas like uh, Montana and uh, Plains in Texas. Uh, Texas produces the most wind energy in the U.S. Uh, the largest wind farm in the world, though, isn't actually in China, and that produces... A ridiculous amount of wind energy wind energy however it's not the most common thing used in the world um, but it is uh, one of the most vast uh, it's one of the ones less used one of the reasons why it's not used that much though is because the wind turbines don't look good uh, a lot of people don't like them because they aren't attractive cosmetically uh, however there's a lot of wide open plains that are far away from any major interstate and uh, the cosmetic thing isn't really a real uh, issue. That's more of a personal problem uh, for this energy source. So the efficiency for wind energy is about 35 to 45%. 45% being peak, like strong wind, perfect against the turbine, great source of energy. Uh, the Again, the issue with these, very similar to solar cells, is that it's most efficient when it's at a 90 degree to the face of the to the propeller just like the fan uh, it's just the best way to do that and uh, unlike the solar cells it is just completely improbable and just a pain to repivot these uh, wind turbines they are horribly large and huge and heavy and expensive and Twisting them to face the right degree would take more energy than you would get out of it. So it's really not feasible. There have been new designs for wind turbines other than the traditional fan and propeller look. Uh, they kind of look like mm, like a double helix, like your DNA. They look like that and they collect wind that way. Uh, those have been... That's a fairly new design and it's not the most efficient at the moment. But we'll have to see in the future about that. Um, theoretically right now, uh, scientists believe that wind energy can get up to 60% efficiency. Now when I say efficiency, I'm going to talk, I'm talking about, uh, the energy that's put in. So the energy the wind is putting in through all its kinetic energy, 
and transferring that into electrical energy. So the amount of kinetic energy and the amount of, and the amount of electric energy. So of that, only about 60% is getting turned into electric. The other 40% is getting lost to uh, friction, heat, noise, all those things that take heat, that take energy, because heat is energy, and so is noise. So all that's just dissipated. The other 40% is dissipated. So a 6% efficiency, though, is extremely high, especially for renewable energy. It's impossible to really get 100% efficiency but as close as we can get the better and 60 percent is very very good 40 percent it was considered a marvel when it first came out and now getting higher would be even more amazing um but 60 percent is a theoretical value there's a lot of factors to go into that and it's still theoretic and since it's theoretical we don't know if it's possible so we'll have to see in the near future hopefully someone can create a new fan blade or find out the right way to harvest the wind for it to become a better uh, energy source. So going on to our last type of energy, which would be turbo energy, uh, turbo being water. Uh, so that can actually be harvested in multiple ways. I'm going to talk about two. Uh, the most common one would be hydroelectric dams, uh, like the Hoover Dam or the dozens if not hundreds of dams in Scandinavia and uh, Europe. They're used to basically anywhere near running water, they would put up a dam. The dam would obviously make a buildup of water behind it. So whenever the water would get high or whenever the people would need energy, they would release the floodgates. The floodgates would let the water flow down at a very high volume and high velocity. And that would spin the water turbine. Now the turbine, of course, would create electricity by spinning copper wires around a magnet and that would create electricity. Some Scandinavian, some Scandinavian countries are even, I think, 80 or 90 percent fully powered by those things. So very, very clean countries, very little emissions. The only emissions they really have are from people's personal vehicles. And even then, not even everyone owns a vehicle over there because they have a great public transit system. Uh, in the U.S., it's not highly used, um, but it is obviously the more the best form uh, for it just because it doesn't matter what type of water we use and the earth is the 70% surface area is water so we have an abundance of water and um, so this this form of energy alone just this type this hydroelectric dam accounted for 20% of the world's electric energy usage which is huge a fifth of our energy came from that and um, seventy percent. Uh, okay, I said that but wrong. I'm sorry. The uh, twenty percent of all energy in the world came from renewable energy. Of that twenty percent, seventy percent of it came from the hydroelectric dam. So, uh, taking that into account, fourteen percent of the world's energy came from those hydroelectric dams, which is very high. Um, for just one source of renewable energy. And it's easily the most efficient one is that. And it has obviously no waste uh, because it's water in, water out. All it does is spin on the way down. The real economic, the real um, environmental downside to this, though, is that if you go to a place where the dams shouldn't be, you can destroy the wildlife behind it. So that's the real downside of these. Obviously, when they build these, they go into extensive research to make sure that doesn't happen. But bad things can happen, dams can break, they can lead to massive floods, so it does have its fair share of risks. The other way for hydro power to be uh, taken is from wave power. Uh, obviously, most people have been to a beach, they've seen a wave. They can use a similar type of turbine to when the wave pushes in, it swings the turbine, and with a special uh, shaped blade on the way out, it spins it in the same direction as well. So when that happens, it just uh, speeds up the turbine and create more electricity. Now, some of the issues with these, though, is that they are not very efficient, and they, again, are not very attractive. Uh, they're just not attractive thing, because uh, most coastlines, at least in the U.S., are either used for public beaches or barges and shipyards. So uh, using that for uh, wave power is not something that everyone in the public is really key for and 
that is just one of the things that needs to be considered when you're talking about renewable energy. Um, another downside to that is that it might also affect wildlife. Uh, if you build it near, let's say, a sea turtle place where sea turtles come and lay their eggs, sea turtles might not uh, like those propellers. They might injure the um, babies when they hatch. They might not be able to even make it to, to the water because of those. Once they do, they just get sucked in the propeller and killed. So that's another problem with that. Uh, the main roadblocks with this is that not everyone is on board with them. Uh, a lot of people in the government and in the world are very... Uh, they they view green energy, renewable energy, eco-friendly energy with uh, uh, hippiedom, just being a hippie, and they aren't really on board with it, and it's not it's not 100% there yet either. It's still been getting experimented with and getting improved. And because of that improvement stage, not everyone's going to get on board with uh, saying, yes, let's do this. It sounds like a great idea, but, in, but theory is not practice. So uh, it doesn't want, not everyone wants to do this. Now, uh, hydroelectric uh, power obviously works in smaller countries, in Nor in like uh, Norway and uh, Sweden, places like them, they have very high uh, hydroelectric dams, uh, hydroelectric dam dependency. But with the U.S. being a very vast, very large country with um, you know tens of times more people, it's very hard to get that kind of dependency on one kind of resource and. Uh, especially since coal, especially since uh, the U.S. has such a dependence on foreign oil, it's very hard for people to change what they're dependent on. So that's why it's not really getting a big tooth in in the U.S. at least. Uh, but for the world, they're slowly going to it, mainly because oil prices are going a lot higher, and there's constantly wars over oil, whether it's in uh, you know Middle East or Russia or wherever. There's always wars about it and uh, a lot of conflicts, whereas conflicts for green energy or renewable energy are getting a lot lower. So it's becoming a lot more, uh, it's becoming a bigger thing to do that with. Uh, now, obviously, there are more forms of this energy. One of them, uh, off the top of my head, would be using the Earth's heat, its own heat from, its, from the Earth's core to power steam engines using cold water from from the bottom of the ocean or from depths below and then uh, hot water from the surface or heating it up through uh, a heating mechanism that runs through the center of the earth. New Zealand is heading up on that. They are of giant geothermal uh, capacity for doing those turbines and so they're going to be doing that. The reason I didn't mention it is because it's not one of the big three and uh, we didn't have time to talk about that today. But uh, in conclusion, I would just like to say that renewable energy is obviously a cleaner and more sustainable sources of energy than non-renewable sources uh, such as coal and natural gas. The issue with it uh, taking full effect is just that not everyone wants to change. They think that because uh, coal and natural gas will last them through their lifetime that no one else should change. To accommodate them so that's one of the big issues with it however green energy is getting much more efficient and I have no doubts that it'll become a lot more efficient in the next few years I would love to see more people driving electric cars or cleaner energy and more people have solar panels on the roofs I think that would be a great uh, thing to add to all newer homes so thank you very much for watching this. Hope you all have a great day. Go buy some solar panels and install them on your roof. And have a good one.